Well, hi everybody. Um, we're back for the second in our autumn series of webinars. Um, I might actually introduce myself this time. I'm Catherine Smale. I'm Exeter Callahan's kind of marketing and business development manager over in the London office at the moment. So um, I think uh, this is the second in our series. Um, I can see from the list of people who've joined us that we've got nationalities from all over the place, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, we've got people from Switzerland, Germany, Greece, um, America, um, and lots of you from Hong Kong. And I know it's really late for you over there. So a huge, huge thanks for joining us um, from Hong Kong. Um, and just a little kind of housekeeping things. Um, there is a chat function over on the right hand side as per usual. Um, so say hello if you'd like to do that. You know, kind of we're always keen to kind of get a bit of a debate going. The presentation last week um, had a lovely debate about sort of um, softwares that people used for the particular um, engineering that they were doing. Um, there's also a question function. Um, so you can pop your questions in there and I think we'll probably take them at the end, but I think potentially they'll address them along the way. Um, so make sure you put them in there and there's a little um, rating things. So if you like it, give it a thumbs up and that will float it to the top. Um, and I think that all that is left to do now is just to kind of introduce um, both Kerry and Giovanni. So Giovanni, to my, uh, well, over here, <laughs> is, um, he is our senior, and structural, senior structural and facade engineer in the London office, and he has a great passion for complex geometric designs, finite element analysis, and um, has done a lot with seismic and blast analysis. And Kerry Hegedis is our, um, who's above me just now, is a guest speaker, which is really lovely to have you on board. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Kerry. Um, project architect with NBBJ over in Seattle. Um, and he is li he likes diverse and unusual projects uh, driven by connection to the community and also designs driven by innovation and performance. And I think we're probably about to hear about one of those just now. So um, yeah, I'll let you take it away. And it's about uh, the world's tallest pre-stressed rod facade on Two Taiku Place. Thanks very much, guys. Take over. Bye. Thanks. I'm going to start and let's make sure I can get this software going. All right. Um, so Simplicity is Deceiving is our title. Um, and as we get into it, you'll see why. I'm just going to kind of introduce the project and I'm going to like set the table and Giovanni will be your, your gourmet chef for today. Um, the project is in, um, in Quarry Bay uh, in Hong Kong, south of the main city. Um, it's a 41 story tower. Um, our client kind of owns a lot of buildings in the district uh, and it's all kind of organized around kind of this exterior great room and each of the towers then has a great room that kind of overlooks on that exterior great room um, our project is the one in red here down in the, the lower center part and um, our great room is the one circle kind of there in white it's a it's a really great site. I mean, Hong Kong is all great sites. Uh, it, there's just this dynamic between like the mountains that are right there and the water and the sense of the sky. And that was a driver uh, in our project about how all these things come together in a relatively short period uh, of, of land. Um, we, you know, we worked the tower a lot. Uh, you know, we had a lot of restrictions, but we worked to make it an elegant shape, how it hits the sky, how it, uh, how it shades itself was all part of the process and a lot of it's still going back to the sky, cloud, land, sea combination. But the tower isn't really the story that we want to tell today. Uh, the, our story is really about what's at the bottom of, of the tower, kind of this raised podium piece. Um, and here I have to zoom in so you can finally see it. So this, this is the part that has a pretension rod, uh, really transparent kind of base. And this is a really innovative kind of glass wall, but the thing is it's not about the glass wall really at all. It's about this ceiling that's inside our, our great hall, which is kind of these uh, cubic shapes that kind of extend down and undulate uh, and really goes from space to space. And sometimes there's boxes, which are restaurants and seating areas and tea rooms that pop through the ceiling. So it's really about the ceiling. Um, so um, Giovanni and my 
role was to not compete with that. How do we make that the star? Um, and that's how this this glass wall came came to be. And it, it looks, and we'll go back. It looks so simple. Uh, it's um, but but looks are deceiving. Um, it, it it looks like a uh, second year architecture student kind of put this together and didn't understand how forces work. Uh, I mean, how can you have a, a wall go up? Uh, 14 and a half meters and be uh, 50 millimeters thick. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Um, but that's that's what we did. And um, it's a really complex system. So I generally work on two types of projects. One where it looks really complicated, but I find a way to make it simple and the kit of parts and put it together very simply. Um, but this one looks really simple but it's really complicated of how it all goes together. Um, and, and it is just a, a big sheet of glass, uh, three meters wide, uh, 14 and a half meters tall, and uh, how it connects the structure and how it integrates and still doesn't bring attention to itself was a lot of what I worked with Giovanni on. Um, and it's, it's not a simple form either. So, um, um, Giovanni's really talented, so I had to like give him some curveballs about uh, on the engineering. So it has these sky bridges that connect to it, um, that kind of punctuate it, and it has undulating top, so um, it has different heights, pieces of glass that come along there, and it's all raised up one floor. Then as it wraps around to the south, you can kind of see it wrapping around there. Um, just in terms of the plan, you can see where the sky bridges come in. The red line is the extent of the cable rod, the, the rest of it that wraps around that floor is to, made to look like it's, but not it's not really the pretension rod. And to get here, we just didn't start here. We we looked at a lot of different options of how to have this transparent facade, how to have minimum thickness because with those sky bridges coming through, we didn't want to eat up a lot of floor area. So fins was problematic for us in the client. And so just through the evaluation process, we we went through a lot of options and we ended up uh, with the integrated rod, which you can see it's its biggest concern. The smaller the dot, the more concern it was. The engineering complexity was really the biggest concern. And then uh, getting approval in the city since something like this uh, hasn't been done there before. That was our other secondary concern. Um, but the client was really in, in, intrigued by it, met all our goals, um, and that's that's the one we decided to go with. So I'll let the Giovanni take it from here. Th thanks a lot, Kerry, for the, the great introduction. Uh, now we will move a bit more into the uh, structural engineering behind the, uh, the, this facade. So first of all, uh, with the, the system description of the, of the facade. So, uh, as you said before, uh, the the facade wraps around three of the four sides of the tower. Uh, so we got uh, uh, some areas are like full light, some other areas are not full light because of the the, the the shape of the of the facade. And therefore, we had to first of all identify which were the area where we needed the road and the area in which we didn't need the road. So. Uh, as you can see here, in the, uh, in the north elevation, uh, we have some uh, uh, full light area with road and uh, some lower facade where we didn't need uh, any, any need for the road. And same is uh, on, the, on the east where basically it was all full light, so all the, the, the glass panels are restrained by roads. And other areas on the, the small area in the south and, uh, and west where we had very few, few bits and pieces with, uh, with, with roads. Uh, so the system is basically based on a, a top and bottom steel beam, which are spanning between the columns of the building. Uh, and these beams supports the pre-stress rod, which then restrain the, the glass panels. Uh, the huge complexity is also given by the fact that the, the columns are like spaced up to 20, 24 meters. So these uh, top and bottom beams uh, were needed to span this huge distance uh, and be able to take the considerable load given by the, the road tension. Uh, we went for a system, an independent system of steel beams uh, because we didn't want to couple the, the floor movement uh, with, the, uh, with the glass wall facade uh, to avoid any uh, live, uh, live load deflection, which were clearly based, 
having effect on the tension in the road and therefore maybe causing problem of fatigues uh, and also because uh, it was the easiest way also to get uh, it approved by the by the municipality because having the two uh, the two system linked would have created them um, much more uh, uh, many more question and adopt with the with the with the authority uh, so uh, as I was saying there are these uh, the, the column uh, the, the called mega column uh, reinforced concrete column which some uh, casting connection uh, on top of the, on this casting connection we are uh, connecting the top and bottom steel beams uh, and uh, the rods gonna span between uh, top and bottom of this uh, the steel beam and then the glass panel will be clamped uh, to the rods to ensure the the, the lateral stiffness of the of the system. So just to give a bit of number, the, the steel beam uh, uh, are quite deep. Uh, they go bit, uh, they are between 1.2 and 1.5 meter deep and between uh, 500 and 700 millimeter wide. Uh, this road system is actually quite quite minimal because the the road uh, the typical road is uh, 52 mil by 45 millimeter, so a, a rectangular bar uh, made of high strength stainless steel. While for what concerns the, the glass panel, the glass panel are made of four uh, plies of 12 millimeter thick glass, uh, fully toughened outside and strengthened inside, uh, with the center glass uh, plus interlayer to to improve the the, the structural performances. Uh, how the system works? So clearly, for vertical load, uh, it are mainly given by the pre-stress. Uh, the the pre-stress is going to the uh, to the top and bottom beam and become shear and clearly bending and then it's transferred back to the to the concrete column uh, for what concerns the lateral loads the out of plane load clearly the the wind load blows against the glass panel which mobilizes the rods uh, which uh, become stiff when deflecting uh, so we are limiting the deflection with the span over 60 and therefore this deflection and therefore and the load the lateral load applied generates increased tension which is again transferred back to the top and bottom beam and then again back to the to reinforce, to the reinforced concrete columns uh, for what concern in plane load since Hong Kong is not a seismic zone so we didn't have problem of seismic load but we did have clearly the drift of the of the structure uh, so the system can kind of rack because the lateral stiffness of the of the of the road is basically uh, very very minimal, and therefore they can assume to be rotating and drag the panel uh, together with them when uh, when the building moves. Uh, it's also fair to say that the lateral drift of the building was quite minimal. I think we were talking about around 20 millimeters. So considering the 15 meter tall the height of the of the system is basically a, a criteria of eight. Uh, divided by 800 roughly so quite quite minimal uh, quite minimal movement to be absorbed uh, but also we had to think also on how to absorb uh, some vertical uh, differential movement uh, at the support of the of the of the rods and the beam uh, because the concrete columns will suffer of a cup creep and therefore there will be some shortening axial shortening of the column uh, which clearly when shortening uh, will uh, compress slightly the the rod, so decreasing the the tension in the rod, which clearly has effects on the on the lateral stiffness of the system. Uh, as we were looking at uh, looking at the, um, the the plan of the of the of the tower, uh, we have this rounded corner that probably are the most interesting. Uh, uh, area of the of the full facade uh, that's because the different geometry between flat and, uh, and curved panel has an intrinsic also uh, influence on the stiffness of the panels uh, therefore uh, what we have to do is kind of uh, individuate like uh, uh, main um, different uh, interfaces uh, the main different interfaces between uh, flat and uh, curved panel uh, flat and flat panels and uh, curved and curved panels. So as you can see here on the screen with position A, that is the uh, typical system, let's say typical interface between flat panels, position B, which is the interface between two curves and position C, that is the interface between flat and curved. So each of these interface can experience differential behavior in terms of movement. So the typical one A is like the ideal one. So we have two flat panels with, that will tend to move like in exactly the same way when we go 
between curved and flat panel, uh, because of the geometry and the different stiffness, the flat panel will tend to move much more from uh, outer plane, from an outer plane uh, point of view. Therefore, we will have some differential radial movements. While when we move back to the curved to curved, the two curved panel for the, the geometry will tend to move into different direction. So even if uh, in absolute value the movement is kind of the same, they will tend to go uh, apart, so move apart from, from themselves. So we will experience some tangential expansion. Uh, for this reason, we had to identify, uh, once, once identified this position, we have to also develop uh, some details that were able to cope with this uh, expected differential behavior of the structure. So the, the typical system, so at uh, position A, we have the rod that clamps the, the glass panel, which are recessed. Uh, and as we don't expect any differential movement, the, the rod can be shared by the two adjacent panels and then move together. When we go to position B and C, where we actually are experiencing some uh, differential movement, either radial or tangential, we have to find a way to accommodate this movement because trying to drag in together the two panels because of the huge displacement and uh, really the height and the load, it was basically impossible. So what we, we thought was to introduce a movement joint and therefore decouple the two, the two panels in introducing two separate uh, rod, uh, which can move independently from each, from each other out of plane and uh, as uh, expanding with the movement joint coping with the differential movement. What we had to introduce as well was uh, something to prevent the two panels to move together when uh, there is some uh, pressure applied on the, on the glass corner. Uh, and we did that through some uh, bearing, uh, some extrusion, still aluminum extrusion, which uh, allowed the two panels to bear together. So to avoid any movement inwards. Uh, other key details are at the opening. Really, opening are always uh, a, a bit of an issue when uh, when dealing with the full light glass panels uh, because of differential stiffness that you you will have between the, the frame and the, the glass itself. And it's even more exaggerated in this case because of the huge flexibility of the of the of the facade and the high, very high uh, expected movements. Uh, so. They, the, the potential of uh, having a, a typical fixed uh, portal frame, especially on the east elevation, which, which is the one where we have the full light glass panel, was basically impossible unless having an, an additional movement joined around the portal frame. That's because the, the differential stiffness between the frame and the, and the very flexible uh, glass panel would have generated very, very high uh, peak stress all around the, the corner of the, of, the, of the portal frame. So what we had to do was to, to develop a detail of a, of a rocking portal frame. So basically, the portal frame is hinged at the base and follows the, 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 glass, uh, the, glass facade, the glass facade and the cable and the rod because it is basically restrained laterally against the, the adjacent rod. So the two rods running parallel to the, to the portal frame are actually connected back to the, uh, to the portal frame columns. And therefore, the portal frame follows the, the movement, reducing as much as possible the stress concentration all around the corner that are still there, but are much, much reduced compared to what we would have if the portal frame was, was fixed. Uh, another another key detail uh, is clearly the, the the anchoring of the of the rod to the to the beam. So what we start we started with uh, was a readily simple detail. So we were assuming the square rod to the rectangular rod to then turn into a circular one uh, through CNC machining, and then uh, having a, a spherical bearing uh and uh, you know threaded knot to uh, ensure that then uh, the the rod was secured uh, against uh, the beam clearly we had to provide opening on the side of the beam for inspection and on the bottom of the beam for uh, for uh, pretensioning unfortunately uh it was a bit of a few problems for for that uh, in getting the, the the approval from from the building department in hong kong so we had to we had to move uh, you know the, the detail to something that is uh, less dependent on a product like was the, the bearing but a bit more intuitive probably from a from a structural point of view so what we had at the end was this uh, rod eye end uh, with a pin 
uh, which is then connected back to the to the, to the top flange uh, in this case of the bottom beam, uh, and therefore uh, the, the rod is still ensuring the same rotational capacity out of plane, uh, but it's just uh, working uh, in a slightly different way how uh, it's connected back to the to the structure. Uh, another quite important detail that we developed was uh, uh, the, the sliding bearing uh, to connect the, the top and bottom steel beam, especially in the east elevation where uh, they are completely straight and flat. So clearly to avoid uh, too much load being transferred because of temperature uh, variation, so increase or decrease, uh, especially because the axial load generated in the, in the beam because of the eccentricity of the beam to the connection of the concrete column would have generated very, very high shear and therefore moments uh, in, the, in the column. So what we had to do is uh, what was coping with this, uh, with this displacement and try to absorb them uh, with, uh, with a sliding bearing detail. Uh, so to minimize the, the friction and the, 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 the residual axial force uh, exchange, we developed this, uh, this sliding bearing, this bidirectional sliding bearing, which was kind of inspired by uh, some sliding bearing that you can find possibly in footbridges where the, the dead load uh, is quite uh, low compared to a few other loads and therefore you can expect some uplift. So basically these two bits of, uh, of beam are kind of tapered and then sits uh, on top of each other and can slide together uh, thanks to neoprene uh, and rubber uh, and rubber pads and uh, at the same time uh, you can ensure that especially at the bottom of uh, the steel beam you can cope with the vertical downwards loads that will be generated by the, the own self weight of the of the structure and upwards that load uh, upwards vertical load uh, that will be generated clearly that, that by the pre-stress uh, applied uh, into the into the rods uh, clearly, what we needed as well was a clear identification of the the, the, the sign load uh, applied on the on the on the facade. Really, in Hong Kong, we all know that typhoon load are the ones that are governing the design. Uh, so, in order to get uh, quite a decent uh, and uh, very refined distribution of loads all around the facade, uh, the uh, wind tunnel test was was carried out on the. On the on the full tower, and clearly for, for this case, we, we are gonna uh, focus especially on the on the podium. So as you can see from the first two images, there were like two main models analyzed uh, in the in the wind tunnel facility. So the first one is the current uh, say situa situation condition uh, uh, of the building. So with the building surrounded by the existing other buildings. Uh, but then, as typical in Hong Kong, uh, you also have uh, uh, another scenario that is called the building removal scenario, where you assume that all the building, at least a portion of the building around uh, your your uh, your structure, is uh, is not there anymore, and therefore is not functioning as a shelter for the for the for the new building. And this way, clearly, most of the time, the uh, the wind excitation, the wind load applied on, on your structure, much higher because you you are a bit more exposed. Uh, while on the uh, right image, you can see just a zoom, a zoom in of the, the, the podium area with all the, the, the sensor to capture the, the, the wind pressure applied. So because of that, and because also we did some, uh, some uh, um, uh, frequency checks on the, uh, on, the, on the facade in order to understand also what was the model behavior of the facade, uh, to understand which were like critical model shape that may be excited by the wind, we we had uh, uh, as a result uh, quite a relevant number of uh, load cases to to study. I think there were around fifteen different uh, uh, wind load cases. So some of them uh, uh, we call like global load case uh, because they were aimed to maximize I don't know the full the pressure suction in some specific area of the. Uh, of the of the facade, like the one on the on the top left corner, uh, while others were actually uh, designed to maximize the the effect uh, at some critical interface. For example, here the bottom left the, is the interface between flat and curved panel, or between uh, curved and curved panel on the bottom right, or for example on the top right, you see the the interfaces between the the portal frame, the fixed portal frame on, on the north side, and the the full light facade that is quite flexible. Uh, Clearly, to analyze everything we have now, all the ingredients, let's say. Uh, so we had to build uh, a very detailed model because we had to to consider all the the, the differential uh, uh, 
contribute of stiffness and uh, structural performance of all the elements basically uh, in the in the system so we had to analyze the the, the facade and the steel as a as unique system to understand what has the effect of the high flexibility onto the the glass in terms of stress and clearly deflection so we are not only modeling uh, the the glass panels but we had to model also the rods top and bottom steel beams, all the connection between the beam and the, and the concrete columns, uh, which are assumed as our fixed point, restraint point, where we apply also the drift and all the, the other movement. Uh, and clearly the clamping detail between the, the glass and the, uh, and, the, and the rods and so on. So also portal frames and, and everything basically had to go together to understand the global behavior of, of the system. Uh, this is a focus at the portal. As I was saying, the east portal uh, is, uh, uh, is a rocking portal. So at the bottom, we have uh, uh, some uh, hinges, basically. So it can rotate and is fixed uh, and supported uh, laterally onto the, the, uh, the, the, the road at the edge to it. And while the north portal, where the, the facade height goes down, and therefore we don't need any more uh, the road, and therefore the, also the expected deflection are much lower compared to the, to the, east, uh, the east portion, we could cope with a, with a normal, let's say, standard fixed uh, portal frame, which we're also supporting the, the glass panel on top that you can see are not pre-stressed because they are not uh, such uh, so, so tall like the, the full light uh, glass panels. Uh, another very important thing was clearly understanding uh, the, the pre-stress value to, to input in the, in the, in the rods. Uh, so for most of the case, what we, we did was developing some uh, a simplified spreadsheet uh, so that given the height, the wind load applied, the, uh, the control and the deflection that we wanted to have, we could understand uh, the, the value of the of pre of pre stress to ensure that this uh, this deflection criteria was respected, uh, but there were like clearly some iteration in that, especially at the interfaces between uh, uh, curved flat and curved and curved. Where as I was saying, we have the movement joint, so we we had basically two different things to to live with. One was clearly uh, providing enough pre stress to restrain the the, the glass panel and not exceed the, the stresses in the panel. Uh, but at the same time, we didn't want to have uh, uh, a too high pre-stress, especially between uh, curved and flat, uh, because if the flat panel is flexible and the curved panel is super stiff uh, because of the pre-stress, the relative movement at uh, the movement joint is going to be exaggerated. And therefore, the movement joint needs to be wider in order to be able to accommodate it. So. There were few iterations trying to find a kind of an optimum balance between restraining, especially the curved panel, in, a, in such a way that the stress are not exceeded, but at the same time, do not re, uh, restrain it too much to avoid that the uh, differential movement were too high and therefore the movement joint were, were to increase. Uh, we, we run uh, the, the, this nonlinear analysis uh, because of the load case, uh, the wind load case, uh, I think at the end there were like roughly 60 uh, serviceability combination and probably around 120 uh, uh, ULS combination because we had to consider also a different level of pre-stress. And uh, main results were clearly the deflection of the glass panel that in the east elevation, which is the, the most flexible one, uh, were reaching uh, around 210. 230 millimeter so just below the 240 millimeter that represent the uh, height over 60 deflection deflection criteria that we were using for what concerned uh, the road uh, single road uh, uh, at ULS uh, we're seeing up to uh, 14 tons uh, of, uh, of, pre of tension load that again for a 52 millimeter by 45 millimeter uh, uh, solid bar, it, uh, uh, it's quite a considerable uh, load, while double rods that are slightly smaller and slightly also less pre-stressed, uh, we, uh, we had around uh, 8 tons of, uh, of, uh, of ULS uh, tension. Uh, one thing that was very important to see and also the code was asking us to do is clearly understanding the sensitivity of the, of the facade to the pre-stress level. 
the, the ideal value of pre-stress is the one that we set, so 100% of this value. In this case, we're around 825 kilonewton maximum in the in the uh, in the single rod, and up to 450 kilonewton in the in the double rod. Uh, but clearly, we had to analyze also some scenario in which we were assuming the rod, the pre-stress in the in the rod were accidentally lost. So, and we assumed that. Uh, uh, up to a 20% loss of this uh, pre-stress, and also for the mainly for the safety of the rod itself in terms of maximum tension, we also an analyzed uh, a case in which uh, the pre-stress were amplified up to a 1.4 factor, which is consistent with the dead load and permanent permanent load factor in uh, in uh, the Hong Kong codes. Uh, but clearly, the most interesting bits was when we decrease, when we have a loss of pre-stress in the rods, because clearly it makes the, the structure more, more flexible. So in this slide at the top row, we have deflection and stress, assuming the nominal pre-stress, so 100%. And on the bottom, we have the uh, uh, decay is analyzed with 80% pre-stress. Uh, clearly, the shape and qualitatively, the, the, the two plots are, are similar, uh, but clearly there is a uh, uh, between the top and the bottom row, there is an increment in uh, uh, deflection and also stresses in the glass. Uh, it, this increment is clearly non-linear, as we were expecting. So when we reduce by 20%, so from 100% to 80%, uh, the pre-stress load, uh, the deflection of the glass of the glass uh, increases roughly by 12%, uh, while the stress uh, increases by roughly 8%. So it's also good to make like two separate consideration on that. Uh, so when we have this uh, accidental, let's say, pre-stress loss in the in the in the in the rods, uh, it's also fair to under, to to see that the deflection is slightly higher, maybe even the the of the the criteria because these are visibility uh, limit states. So it's kind of acceptable that for this specific scenario, which is an accidental one, we can allow for a bit more deflection in the in the in the glass, but what is important to, to, to check is that even with this accidental case, the stress are still within the limits when all the other loads are applied. So that was the case here. So when we run this analysis, the, the, the primary check was to, to make sure that the glass stresses were below the threshold uh, and the strength of the glass, uh, even with this reduced uh, pre-stress level. For what concerned the design of the movement joint, uh, uh, what we what we had to do was basically going through all the the, the load case we we analyzed and basically pick up the one which were generating the worst case uh, relative movement between uh, the flatter curved or curved and curved uh, glass panels. So as you can see on the top top left, uh, this diagram is basically showing. Uh, but a specific point in this case is the interface between uh, the flat and the curved panel. All the relative deflection captured for each load case analyzed uh, for, for the wind. Uh, from this one, we clearly picked up the worst case scenario. And uh, basically what we, we did was designing the width of the and the length of the of the movement joints uh, to be able to absorb the stretch out uh, generated by the radial and tangential differential movement. Uh, for what concerned the stresses, as expected, uh, uh, the stresses were clearly higher uh, around the, the 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 corner of the of the portal frame, uh, while generally the flat panel were not seeing uh, many many much, much high stresses. Uh, and also, it's also curious to see that the the also high stresses were expected on the on the curved panel. That's because, first of all, the corner of the of this facade we're seeing uh, a bit uh, the, the maximum load, let's say the 3.5 kPa, which was the maximum design load, was uh, expected into the the, the curved panel. Uh, but the stresses were also higher because, uh, as I was saying before, uh, we had to calibrate the pre-stress uh, around the, the curved panel to make sure that the movement joint was not too too big, and therefore the stress level around the curved panel is quite lower compared to the to the flat one uh, for this reason the roads provide less restraint to the glass panel which can tend then to span from top to bottom and not only from from road to road and therefore we have this increased stress in the middle of uh, of the panel uh, clearly we have to check also the the natural frequency uh, of the of the facade uh, 
Uh, so what we can see and what we expected as well is clearly that the east elevation where we have the rock portal frame is the most flexible area, uh, having a natural frequency of around 1.2 hertz. And this is still above the threshold set by few calls like the Hong Kong one and also the American one where uh, above one hertz, you don't need to consider uh, uh, some dynamic effect on the on the structure. Uh, nevertheless, when we exchange information during the, the wind tunnel test, uh, we also provided this, uh, this frequency and model shape uh, uh, values. Uh, and therefore, actually, the, the load coming from the wind tunnel test was also considering uh, a bit of the, this dynamic behavior of, uh, of the structure. Uh, it's also worth noting that, uh, that uh, uh, these frequencies calculated assuming only the pre-stress is present in the in the rods. So we, the, the stiffness given by only the pre-stress. Clearly, when the wind blows, the the pre -stress, the stress level and the tension level in the rod is going to be higher, and therefore we are going to see a slightly uh, higher frequency. So the one that we have here is kind of the bottom uh, limit for the for the for the pre for the for the frequency in the in the in the facade. Uh, what we have to do as well uh, were few brick models uh, uh, for the for the building department uh, and for the, the approval authority uh, procedure. And uh, what we we had to do as well in Hong Kong is clearly a four, uh, four point uh, uh, four point bending test uh, to evaluate the composite action in the in the buildup. This is uh, mandatory in Hong Kong. So you, if you want to use uh, um, uh, um, effective thickness and therefore composite action in the in the glass, you must do the uh, a four point bending four point bending test. And nevertheless, whatever is your results, so even if you get the full uh, full composite action, you are limited by a seventy percent of the effective thickness to be to be considered. Uh, so what we did was kind of using uh, these results also for a different purpose. In order to validate uh, the brick model that we have to 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 generate and analyze. After that, we also recreate the setting out of the of the four point bending test in uh, in the finite element model uh, and test it, uh, analyze it, and compare it with the results of the actual samples uh, analyzed in the in the test uh, in the test lab. And what we we saw to validate the 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 good level of let's say our our brick model uh, was compared these two results and we can see in the in the diagram that basically uh, the predicted uh, behavior from the finite element model that is the the straight line in in blue is very very consistent with the the results expected uh, and uh, extrapolated by the by the test results. So what we had to do uh, was uh, to run uh, uh, analysis of single panels. Uh, to understand uh, the behavior of the panel and the distribution of the stress across the, the plies, uh, as it was requested by the, the approval, uh, the approving authority. Uh, so uh, we had to build these models. We were quite refined in terms of uh, the, the various components that we have to, to model. Uh, and as you can see, probably better in the section cut uh, on the on the right, where we compare a section through the finite element model and uh, the section detail for the for the rod to glass clamp. Uh, we had to reproduce as much as uh, accurately as possible the behavior. So we had to introduce clearly not only the glass and uh, uh, SGP interlayer uh, in the model, but also the point contact, so the bearing point between uh, the, the the glass and the clamp, and careful the the, the rods and all the linking between uh, this element, the clamping, the and the bearing block. So they were like quite accurate model, uh, uh, which also take quite long time to to run. And we had to analyze clearly not only the, the flat panel, but also the curved one. Uh, but this analysis also highlighted even more uh, the, the behavior that we were uh, uh, expecting, and also I was mentioning before. So for what concern uh, the flat panels, uh, we basically can see a very typical one-way spanning behavior. So as a simple supported beam spanning between rod and rod, with clearly some uh, uh, slightly help coming from top and bottom shoe uh, in order to reduce the stress. But basically, you can see that uh, uh, the shape of the stress is almost basically similar to the one of a, if I was just taking a, a, a slice of the panel and assuming it was a simply supported beam spanning from, from rod to rod. 
different behavior is uh, the one of the curved panel. Uh, especially if you look at the, the stress plot that is the one on the on the right. So as you can uh, as you can see, the shape of the of the stress plot is very very similar to the one of a foresight supported panel. So there is this two way spanning behavior, uh, uh, which is basically given by two main reasons. The obvious one is that being the panel curved, it has an intrinsic higher stiffness uh, given by the geometry. So uh, it will tend also to span from top to bottom and not only from side to side. Furthermore, since the pre-stress level on the side is quite relaxed compared to the, to the flat panels, the sides of the, of the curved panel provides a less, less uh, uh, stiff uh, support and therefore redistribute even more the loads, not only from side to side, but also from, from top to bottom. Um, other model that we have to, to run and analyze just to make sure that the detail were, were okay, were also the, the transition of the road uh, at, the, at the anchor point. As I was showing before in the detail, we have this uh, rectangular road that then becomes uh, a pin high. Uh, and uh, we, we actually did uh, model this to ensure that uh, during the transition from the rectangular uh, section to the, uh, to, the, to the road end, there were no huge uh, stress intensification because of the, of the Geometry, geometrical change. Uh, so we did some uh, some analysis, also sensitivity test on this analysis to understand the right uh, um, uh, finite element uh, type to use and the mesh of this element, the number of nodes in order to calibrate and get something that was consistent and independent from the mesh size and uh, from the the number of nodes in the in the in the model. And as you can see here, the transition is quite smooth from uh, from the, the rectangular section to the uh, to the to the road end. Uh, as uh, the the detail was showing as well, uh, the beam uh, has uh, uh, a relevant number of uh, of openings uh, because of clearly the penetration of the of the road and also on the side because we had to be able to inspect. Uh, the road connection and from the bottom because we need to be able to pre-stress the road. And since the, the stiffness of this beam is very uh, important for the overall uh, deflection and uh, redistribution of forces inside the road, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, a, a beam like that with this, uh, with this number of openings uh, uh, was not uh, too flexible if compared to a beam without any opening. So what we did was to compare uh, to beam the same uh, made with plate models so not uh, as a beam model uh, in order to be able to reproduce the the opening inside the beam so we compared the beam with and without the opening and we applied the uh, uh, force distribution coming from the the global model analysis in order to have uh, 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 a behavior that is kind of reflecting what we expecting from from the model uh, and compare the the results of the beam without openings and a beam with openings. Uh, we applied torsion to understand uh, if this opening were also uh, affecting the torsional stiffness of the beam. And what we could see is that uh, clearly the beam with openings is slightly more flexible, but this uh, increased flexibility is quite contained and is uh, in, in a range of 10%. So what we could do is uh, take as an assumption when uh, uh, analyzing back the global model was to slightly reduce by a 10% the uh, the yam modulus of the of the material used for the for the beam so that we could uh, kind of accommodate for this increased flexibility just uh, simply uh, with uh, with a different value of uh, of yam modulus for the for the steel members so uh, we have mentioned quite a few times the the, the approval authority. Uh, so the path for for uh, for getting this approved was quite long and started quite early in the day of the of the project, uh, because as uh, Kevin was mentioning, uh, there was no precedent, especially in Hong Kong, of uh, something like that. Not even uh, standard cable wall facade. Uh, where uh, with this uh, relaxed, let's say, deflection uh, criteria uh, were ever approved uh, in the Hong Kong area. So we, we had to start uh, the discussion uh, together with our local engineers, uh, the local engineers uh, of the project with uh, Arup, uh, to, to communicate uh, with, uh, with, the, with the building department. Uh, so we started a schematic design when we issued a 
pre-submission inquiry that is a kind of uh, a request to you know uh, to uh, have an understand a general understanding of the of the of the behavior of the of the of the building of, in this case of the, the facade to kind of prepare the, the the building department which is the approval authority to to a future future submission uh, on that uh, so clearly we get back lots of comments from from uh, from uh, this uh, from this pre-submission inquiries um, and clearly we had to to work in parallel while uh, developing the detailed design for it we had to clearly develop also and respond to to this comment so uh, after that uh, in september 2018 we started uh, and issued uh, the first uh, the first submission to the building department uh, the building department took uh, uh, usually take uh, 60 days to, to review it and uh, after the, the reviewing period we had uh, several several comments also due to the fact that in the meanwhile uh, a new the new glass code basically was was released uh, in hong kong uh, so we had also had to do some quite uh, intense uh, uh, amendment in terms of uh, also of uh, using different load combination and uh, other criteria for the for the glass, including the the the, the effective thickness of, of the glass. Um, uh, what we did then is clearly uh, resubmit, and we did it uh, three months after the first submission. Uh, in that case, the, the the feedback from the from the approval authority was uh, was still rejecting the, the 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 submission, but the comments were definitely not as bad as the first one. So in less than one month, roughly, including also Christmas time in the middle, uh, we may, we were able to to amend uh, and respond to all these comments to get finally the, the approval uh, from the building department in uh, in March uh, 2019. So roughly six months after the, the first submission that what was, you know, considering the, the challenges that we were you know, knowing, uh, it, it was not, not, uh, not too bad. And also thanks to the uh, our uh, Hong Kong office that uh, uh, helped us uh, in the daily communication together with with Arup, uh, with the with the building department uh, for of this minor amendment, especially. Uh, it's true that it, it was approved, but uh, to ensure that it was approved in principle, we have to also take some uh, few compromises uh in some details and also left some very minor comments uh to the for the contractor to to do some amendment uh, submission later on uh so the principle was was approved but there were still some bits and pieces to 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 look at so the most critical one was the uh, the the detail between the, the the roads and the and the glass panel so in our initial design intent uh, the idea was to have the glass recessed uh, with uh, the clamping plate of the rods being flush with the with the glass. As a compromise that we hoped was temporary at the time, uh, we had to kind of uh, submit, assuming that the glass was not recessed anymore, and there were and the, for the, the clamping was kind of sandwiching the the glass panel uh, together with the with the with the steel rods. Uh, unfortunately, even uh, if uh, we submitted together with the, the the contractor that, by the way, is uh, GNM Engineering, uh, which kind of supported also quite uh, heavily uh, in uh, in these uh, in these amendments, uh, we 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 submitted lots of uh, detailed calculation again, uh, uh, detailed brick model to understand to to show that uh, uh, the stress uh, in the interlayer because this was the main concern from the approval authority uh, was within a quite decent limits and it was, the, the safety factor was quite high. In our case, it was around 11 compared to the, the strength of the SGP interlayer calculated at 50 degrees, so clearly the, the conservative one. But unfortunately, there was, uh, we had to, to give up uh, on on these details. So what you can see on the bottom is the final design from from GNM, uh, which basically based on on ours, uh, and where we have the the glass that is uh, clamped uh, outside from uh, the from its thickness uh, by this uh, clamping plate. So no no recess uh, in the glass. There were a few. Uh, luckily, all the other details were uh, kind of maintained, uh, especially the visible one, and also GNM with the drawings. Uh, 
was very consistent also with uh, with our design. So they they did a very good effort in trying to maintain as much as possible the um, all the detail that we we were uh, having in our intent. A uh, few other things that changed were the sliding bearing, uh, which was basically transformed in a slotted connection with the uh, Teflon uh, Teflon sheets to to uh, ensure the the sliding of the of the beam under under permanent under temperature load. But that is it was mainly just a structural consideration is not something that is uh, visible uh, so it was not a navy change let's say from uh, an architectural point of view uh, the current status so the 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 been the pmu testing of the of the of a portion of the of the facade a full light clearly pmu testing full scale uh, of the corner portion uh, which has been uh, constructed and uh, fine uh, tested uh, uh, till the end of uh, uh, august beginning of uh, of september so the tests were uh, all brilliantly uh, achieved uh, by the by the by the pmu and um, uh, for the future, uh, future steps are uh, the installation of the of the of the beam, uh, which should take place between December and January uh, next year, uh, and uh, the installation of roads, pre-stressing of roads, and then glass, which likely will happen uh, between uh, May and, uh, and June, I think. Uh, but we have also a few few pictures to show for the for the PMU test, uh, which were kindly shared by by GNM, the contractor. Uh, as for obvious reason, we couldn't uh, uh, travel and uh, and assist to the test. But it was very good the coordination we had because uh, we had a very collaborative uh, uh, interaction and uh, trying to understand uh, uh, all the steps uh, and also making sure that. Uh, uh, Every step uh, of the installation and then the pretensioning and uh, all the tests were kind of in line with what we expected from uh, the analysis we we ran and we and we did to make sure that all the results were consistent and we were going uh, into the the right the right direction. So you can see on the on the left uh, uh, the the top uh, the bottom beam in that case being uh, being installed. Uh, I'll really like the the picture on the, on the right where you can really appreciate the scale of the of the of the test in this case and out of the the facade in general. Looking at the 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 worker uh, sitting on top of the of the bottom beam. Uh, here are some images of the the glass the glass panel installation. And uh, this is basically uh, when it the, the installation wa was completed. So you can see all the glass panel uh, in place and uh, uh, the, the, the clamping being uh, installed and the movement joint between the flat and the curved panel, that small line in black that uh, you can see on the uh, where the crane is. So now, before closing, I will just share a couple of videos. Apologies for the first one, it's going to be a bit noisy. Uh, but again, this video are basically taken. One uh, is the um, uh, some video of the water tightness test. Another one is showing with the uh, with the PMU with the, the PMU under structural load test. So I'm going to show. So this was the penetration water penetration test according to ASTM and AAMI uh, with a pressure applied of one kPa onto the the the, the glass with this with fan here and uh, to understand uh, what was the, the clearly the, the level of penetration of water. I think it was also and a further test was uh, was carried out with 2.5 kPa of pressure that is quite quite heavy for for this kind of test and uh, it was uh, it was fine also. So with this uh, increased uh, increased pressure, uh, and then this one is also a very nice one. It's a close uh, uh, view of the the movement joint under the uh, the st structural test, 
which goes up 250 percent the the design load so we are talking about 5.25 kpa uh, applied on the on the on the structure so you can see here the interface between the curved and the, and the flat panel with the flat panel clearly moving much more and uh, the 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 movement joint uh, coping with this movement uh, expanding so we are basically almost at the maximum here just gonna go a bit quickly and you see now the pressure is relieved and the the panel uh, goes back to position uh, with the with the movement joint together and last piece show basically the the panel going back in the the starting point with the movement joint recovering uh, uh, his original position uh, well, thanks also the uh, GNM for for sharing this video with us uh, it was very useful since we we couldn't be there having uh, their uh, daily reports and uh, and pictures and videos to understand more how things were were going. And that was all. Probably it was a bit too long. Thanks everyone. And again, as they say, thanks a lot to everyone listening, especially who stayed quite late to yeah to us. Absolutely. I mean, it's gone dark outside now, but um, what a fantastic, fantastic project. Um, I think if ever there was a project where you could say the devil was in the detail, it's this one, isn't it? It's kind of um, so many different things to have to take into account um, and to really sort of pinpoint and get right. I mean, I have so many questions of my own, but um, I think we can sort of maybe roll some of these questions that we've got here Um into one perhaps. So I think uh, Richard Blandy has said, um, uh, could this be carried out in the UK with the requirement on thermal and cold bridging? Could you do it with double and triple glazing? But then could we sort of also roll that into perhaps, um, uh, is it coated, was the glass coated with a significant... Um, no, the glass was not coated because... Things? Uh, mm. Yeah, it was no coated glass, it was clearly single glazed glass, uh, no, no coating because uh, the aim there was clearly maximizing the the transparency of the of the of the system. We clearly had to balance it with the with the curtain wall of the tower, where actually the the thermal performance there were really really good, and also allow us to achieve quite good score for uh, for uh, you know thermal performances of the full tower as a unique system. But if we look at especially the the, the podium glass, uh, there the, the the aim was was different was clearly having this as much as possible transparent facade uh, trying to show off the the ceiling as uh, as Gary was saying before yeah absolutely and so sort of in terms of could you do this in the UK um, you know kind of with the different performance requirements that the UK has also you know can you find contractors to build um, things like this you know kind of is there a, are there are the capabilities out there to be able to do it across the world so regarding uh, UK, so the problem with uh, with using uh, uh, IGU is basically that uh, the IGU clearly on the side, especially where the spacer bar is, uh, you need to control the deflection uh, much more to avoid that the spacer bar uh, kind of is uh, experienced to, to high curvature and therefore lose the, the sealant properties, basically. So not sealing anymore the, the, the cavity. So with if we we are to do that clearly the, the the deflection in the road needs to be controlled much more and what this mean what this means mean is uh, quite higher much higher uh, pre-stress level in the roads and therefore forces in the supporting structure it's also true that in the uk we do not experience this uh, very huge wind load so that that's a good point uh, but yeah, the critical things is uh, that the deflection for an IGU needs to be controlled much more. Therefore, we will need to uh, have much higher pre-stress and therefore a much more robust structure also supporting the system. Yeah. And uh, for what concerns the, contract the contractor, clearly being a very uh, kind of peculiar system, quite unique, I will say, uh, it's not very easy to, to find uh, people uh, who are kind of happy maybe to Take it on board in terms of complexity of the analysis and also uh, for the installation. Uh, good things is clearly, you know, uh, the best thing is always being collaborative and 
uh, having good cooperation with uh, the designer mm -hmm. in this case. Uh, uh, we had a very nice uh, interaction with, with GNM, so they were very happy to discuss and uh, to go through all the, the issues. Also, we kind of assist them uh, uh, with the analysis, trying to understand altogether what was the critical complexity from an uh, analysis point of view, and also what are the, the difficulties from their side in uh, installing and um, uh, building uh, the, the, the components. Uh, so clearly, the key item is the communication between the parties, because the system is, is very difficult. So yeah. it needs to, <laughs> we need to have, uh, no, quite uh, intense communication and uh, interaction between all the parties uh, involved to make sure that then the level achieved uh, is the one that we, we, we want. Yeah. The, um, I think you mentioned early on in the presentation that the bars were rectangular in section. Yes. Um, do, so Dirk's asked about um, the cap have cables being considered um, during the time, you know, kind of why would you pick one over the other? But also I can, can I add on to that in terms of, so you had the beams which disconnected it then from the floor plate, which obviously mm -hmm. with the live load deflection, but can you re-access, how do you maintain the tension in the, in the rods basically kind of throughout the life? Can you re-access those um, openings in the beams? Is that something you can do? Uh, you yes, to? exactly. Uh, just replying to the last one, uh, yes, we have, the, uh, we have this opening uh, in the beam to, to access uh, the beam and uh, retentioning. What we have also is uh, uh, implement, we have implemented also a system of load cells at the, at the bottom of the, of the, the road connection uh, so that basically the tension, uh, tension level can be uh, basically lively controlled uh, remotely. Uh, so it's clearly easy to, to spot if there is any fault some, somewhere. Uh, but the, the whole point of the detail is uh, having this opening on the outside of the, of the beam so that we can just remove the cladding and go there, access it, uh, check uh, if there is any uh, damage on the connection, and eventually from the bottom also having an access hole from rest restressing the, the, the cables, uh, yeah. the rods, sorry. Uh, for what concerns the cables, uh, clearly a standard cable system was not really working for the geometry that we had, and also because uh, uh, a cable wall has a built-in uh, uh, kind of uh, depth, because usually the rods are offset from the from the glass facade, and then you have like lo usually localized the uh, clamp, uh, uh, which connect then the glass back to the to the rod. And this was not really what what Kerry uh, and the team wanted. Let's say we wanted to have really a kind of a consistent wall going up, being as thin as possible, and therefore there was nothing as uh, a rod with. Uh, glass system who could reduce which could reduce as much uh, as we did the uh, the overall thickness of the of the wall without having any localized uh, big elements like glass fin or mullions and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh Kerry, just to bring and you the in geometry of the uh, curved oh sorry yeah, sorry also restriction on the cable yeah yeah so saying the the geometry uh, because of the curve the with cable would have been a bit more complicated to, to resolve the, the, the geometrical mm. issue at the corner. Um, Kerry, just to bring you in on this kind of, um, what, what kind of buildings would you like to see? What's the next stage for this? You know, kind of what can you see being the kind of next stage of design for it all? Well, for the pretension rod, I mean, I'm a minimalist and that's what I love about the system, but uh, it does have some energy concerns in terms of this is all a laminated unit. Mm. So I, I, I like the idea of it, but it is kind of a targeted use like this podium um but variations of it i could see variations of it if if giovanni can figure out how to make it out of a of an insulated unit somehow which i think is a, <laughs> a high challenge in itself with the separation um sergio um i mean, I mean it's, it's it's all on you giovanni basically it's, it's all on you <laughs> to develop the system um, He's responded to every challenge so far. <laughs> exactly. And he knows the problem. So, you know, it's kind of uh, just need to solve it now. That's fine. Um, Sergio was saying, what's the general approach used for applying the pre-stress on the rods? I may have missed it. So I think that was kind of where you had the perforated beams, the openings in the beams, and you could open those things up just to make sure we kind of met, met that. Yes, basically, um, if I can go probably back to the 
to the detail just to show a bit more that. Uh, what we have uh, is uh, opening uh, not only on the site but also on the uh, on the bottom. So I don't know if I can maximize with this one. So basically, from uh, the um, the end of the 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 rod terminates with the with a pin, and uh, is then connected back to these other components which host the the pin. Uh, so this component has uh, a threaded uh, 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 hole here, uh, into which we can thread uh, another steel bar, which goes out uh, from this uh, other opening we got at the bottom. And therefore, this bar can then be connected to an hydraulic check for which, uh, with which we can uh, pull, pull down the, the rods and provide the uh, the, the the tension level that that we want. So it's all basically done through this access hole on the bottom flange of the beam, which is visible also also here, uh, through the system of threaded uh, steel uh, bars uh, that can then be connected back to a hydra an hydraulic jack. Yeah. Um, there's another question, I suppose, in terms of so when we were talking um, just now about sort of. Uh, maintain the tension in the rods and things like that but actually and you know you said you could go back and you can actually retention them if needs be what happens if one of the panels of glass breaks is there a sort of a requirement from the BD in um, in Hong Kong you know they kind of you, you need to be able to replace it how easy is it to replace um, especially if one of those curved panels breaks with the movement joints movement joints might make it easier I don't, um, uh, yeah. So yeah, basically, it's never going to be easy to replace uh, mm -hmm. almost 15 meter tall uh, glass panel. Mm -hmm. So that that's clearly uh, a risk. Uh, although you know the design that we 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 try to do is clearly uh, also considering all these fail safe scenarios. So trying to minimize as much as possible the risk of, of breakage. Good things is that all the uh, the connection between the the glass panel and the, the rods and top and bottom are very easy to access and are easy to them being dismantled from both inside and outside. So uh, in terms of what is restraining the glass, it can be easily accessed and therefore the glass can be, let's say, easily replaced. Uh, there is nothing specific uh, requirements uh, on that. Clearly the, the panel, the, the rod itself can clearly withstand alone without any any rod, any rod, glass being applied. Actually, it's clearly getting rid of uh, uh, the, the uh, the wind load on, on top of it. There is clearly going to be a bit of uh, uh, unbalanced load, but uh, at the same time, you know, that the connection at the top and base of the uh, of the of the rod is is able to to take it. And in any case, the rod itself, uh, being a solid section, very small, is doesn't have any torsional stiffness, so not going to absorb uh, much much torsion as well. So, uh, from a safety point of view, still uh, the steel rod without the glass is clearly. Uh, gonna be balanced and it can can stand without any help of the glass. Uh, but the good thing is that the glass can be easily, from what easily can be for a 50 meter tall glass panel, uh, <laughs> accessed and uh, and replaced and reinstalled without compromising any other detail all around. Just local or the on the panel which are which is failed. Yeah, that is incredible, actually, isn't it? In terms of being able to kind of replace something that um, that fundamental. Yeah in terms of kind of to the design of the actual overall um, thing, especially with all those kind of tiny details going into it. Um, I suppose what's next, you know, kind of what, what's the next development of it? Is this something which kind of you're looking at kind of innovating further? Is it kind of a technology which you can go further with? Um, can you minimize the size of the bars? You know, that, that kind of thing. Um. Well, uh, it all depends clearly from the from the, the, the environmental condition and also the, you know clearly the, the, the geographical location. Yeah. Uh, so there is clearly potential of uh, especially when we have less demanding uh, approving authority uh, to optimize even even more the um, uh, the design, try to reduce the, the the glass thickness and reduce also the uh, the size of the of the bar, but uh, in terms of engineering behind, 
uh, it, it's difficult to to find something that can uh, uh, can work the same, say even better than that in terms of spanning this uh, long span uh, with less uh, less build up and less uh, less material. Uh, but clearly, there is still space of optimization, uh, and in specific uh, circumstances, maybe with other geometry. Uh, what we could do, as we've done in other projects, is also avoiding maybe to have uh, the glass uh, clamp uh, uh, actually being physical, but just having a silicon joint on top of that, taking the shear. Uh, was clearly not possible here, especially at the at the curved uh, mm. because of the curved uh, geometry. But in other cases, it may be you know another option to even minimize even more uh, the 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 steel uh, uh, presence, you know, in the in the structure. Yeah, I mean, yes, I mean, I, I suppose. Um, you guys have done kind of all sorts of different evolution of connections with glass and things like that, you know, kind of ranging through to the Steve Jobs Theatre, which kind of has yeah. that silicon joint exactly. that you're talking about in terms of the, the shear taken through the silicon. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, we have some more sort of very specific questions. Um, sort of, so I think, um, was the glass designed on ASD? Now, I'm not sure what that means, but I'm sure you will do. Uh, and the rest of the system based on LRFD. Um, uh, and then it also says, was it ever strength ever controlling or was it all deflection? I presume that's got something to do with the Typhoon loading, actually. So maybe. Uh, yeah, basically uh, what we we started uh, uh, since the, the glass, there was no glass code uh, uh, when we started uh, in Hong Kong. <laughs> so it was just a, a, a document. Uh, uh, we uh, kind of... Uh, 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 use the the ASTM, so the American standard approach, which really for the glass just as the ASD, the allowable stress design uh, approach, not the load factor resistance uh, design. Uh, that is the LFRD one. But really, with the evolution and with the uh, with the release of the the Hong Kong code, uh, basically the Hong Kong code for the glass uh, is based as well as the steel code for uh, in Hong Kong and concrete code in Hong Kong uh, with uh, a typical ULS uh, approach. So like the equivalent or LFRD for the, for the American standard. So basically all the design was based on the load factor uh, resistance design. So not the allowable stress one, which okay. also a bit better because it kind of give you a better understanding of what is the, the safety uh, mm -hmm. factor that you're actually using because you can differentiate between the material one, the, the load one. So we, we had to follow that and there was a consistent approach. It was actually better because we didn't have to separate like 20,000 combination, one for HD, one for the for the steel. So we could uh, kind of combine everything together in one, uh, one list of uh, yeah. uh, load cases and combinations. Yeah. Um, I think we've got time for uh, one very quick question, I think, before um, before we should probably wrap all of this up. Um, if your question hasn't been answered, then we will get back to you. Um, I think Giovanni and uh, Kerry will get back to you um, after that because we have all your contact details. So don't, don't worry if your question hasn't been answered. But one last one, very quick one. Um, Dirk has asked, I may have missed it, but the curved laminated glass, um, what was the curved laminated glass tempered or annealed? No, it's, uh, it's tempered. It's so clearly, uh, it was in the in the size and ra the radius was in the in the range for which it could be it could be tempered. So we got fully tempered glass outside and it strengthened the glass uh, glass inside. Even because, as I was saying uh, in the presentation, the level of stress uh, in the curved glass is actually sometimes even higher than in the flat one because of the base consideration we had. So we couldn't. Uh, make it work basically with uh, with an annealed, an annealed, but clearly the geometry was based also on the fact which of the the limitation in the production of uh, of temperate curve glass. Uh, super. Okay. Well, in which case then I'm going to sort of um, bring this to a close, but say thank you a huge, huge, huge thank you to both Kerry um, who set us up beautifully. You made a beautiful table setting for it, Kerry, as, as you said at the beginning. <laughs> Fantastic, you can set the theme there. Um, and thank you very much indeed to Giovanni. Um, thanks thank very you. much for joining us. Um, and sweet dreams, sweet uh, Taiki Place dreams for those people <laughs> who are just about to go to bed now. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you um, if you want to pass this on to other people to watch it, we'll have it back on our website tomorrow, or you should be able to replay it. You can also sign up for the other web webinars on our new section of our website. And also um, you can watch the one that was last week from Mitsu, who was brilliant. Um, our next presentation next week will be from Lisa. Um, Lisa Ramig, who is our director in our Los Angeles and San Francisco offices, 
uh, talking about um, facades and the tool that they've just developed to be able to put together sort of custom um, custom curtain wall facades, but from a standard list of parts, which I think will be super interesting. That one is not going to be recorded because we have kind of, um, we have very strict sort of rules from the client. So it won't be recorded. So make sure you tune in to see that, uh, see that live because it won't be recorded and put up later on. But um, have a lovely evening, have a lovely sleep to those of you who are joining us later on and have a lovely day to those of us in America who have also joined us. <laughs> And um, we shall see you next week. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Take care. Night Thanks night. to everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.